One of the best ways to save water is to water at the right times and in the right amounts. When people uh, leave water on too long, the soil can't hold it all and that water is lost out the bottom of the profile. Um, and so knowing when to turn the water on, when to turn it off is really important. So irrigation is the largest water user uh, by far. It's 80 to 90 percent of the water uh, diverted or used, um, consumptively used in, in the western states. Over half of the, the land that's irrigated in the state of Washington is these big center pivots. When we can uh, improve the efficiency of these in a, in a small way, we can uh, have a large impact on, on the amount of water that's available. Everybody figured out that if you used a gooseneck and then drop the drop down, you know, most of them are about six to, you know, eight feet off the ground. Um, and then you use a, a type of sprinkler that kind of sprayed, spread the water out that way, that you could lower the pressure of the pivot and then your efficiency really increased. And what we're looking at here is uh, a spearmint field. We grow both spearmint and peppermint. And uh, about three years ago, we got introduced to this Lisa system, which would be, what you're seeing there is this one tower it was with these ultra low uh, heads uh, closer together, real low pressure, basically just dropping the water onto the ground. You decrease the drop spacing so the drops are, you know, less than about five feet apart. They're, they're very close together so a lot more drops, um, but then you drag the water all the way on the ground. However, we can also do with uh, put a little sp a small sprinkler on the end of that drop to help spread the water out a little bit and, and help get a more uniform coverage. What we found in the, the two years that we've harvested this was that uh, in mint it's uh, pretty beneficial. We were seeing a significant increase in yield and we're thinking of uh, converting this entire pivot to uh, this Lisa system and maybe put probably put uh, flow meters on either pivot, both pivots and hopefully find that we use less water and get a better yield. Where this using LIPA and LISA is really gonna pay a uh, farmer's back is in cases where there is a water shortage. They don't have enough water to adequately irrigate their crop and their crop is under real water stress. In those conditions, you get 20% more water to the soil per gallon of water that you pump it's going to pay huge dividends in terms of money back to the in, in the in the farmer's pocket. Our water district here it has senior water rights, and so we did not get cut back in a water short year. But that doesn't mean that we don't need to be uh, do due diligence for the amount of water we use because uh, uh, it's the only right thing to do. And uh, so we have had adequate water, but. Uh, I'm not so sure the time isn't going to come where um, it's either going to cost us more uh, by the acre foot than what we're paying and, or lack of, thereof. So you save water, you save energy, um, and we're finding that you, know, you, you still get uh, you know, really good quality. Water is becoming a, a bigger and bigger issue and uh, we have less access to it. Another concurrent theme in agriculture these days is just systems that are really reliant on a lot of inputs like plastic and irrigation and like applying tons and tons of water. We decided to grow about two acres here in dry farmed vegetables which means that we don't have to um, weed nearly as much. We don't have to buy plastic for weed suppression or to lay out for drip irrigation. What that means is that we, we have a, a good window, if we do it right in May through June, where we pretty much don't have to do any, um, any work. If you're not um, you know, setting up irrigation, moving irrigation pipe, fixing your pump, um, you know, putting that time into irrigation, and then irrigating weeds that you're then managing, you're freeing up a lot of time. That's one of the reasons I did this, is because I've tried different things, and, and everything seems to be so labor intensive. And also the water required and last year there were uh, some of the people had their water shut off out here because of the um, the water right shut off because of the uh, low water 
And so I thought, well, I'm not going to fight these guys that have these big farms. I'll just see what I can do to work with these fellows and, and just find something that I can do that will that I, will be productive for me, but not infringe on what they've already started. So this seems to be the answer. I think there's a lot that we are capable of growing without watering here, and it's site specific. You know, we're all on different sites, you know, how deep your soil is, like the water holding capacity and all these things play into it, the microclimate. So they, um, everybody's in a different situation, but I think we are in a pretty special place with this dry Mediterranean-like climate with these dry summers and 40 plus inches of annual rainfall where there's a lot that we can do without irrigation. Well, I was, I was surprised that we could grow something like a pumpkin, which takes a lot of water. Uh, our summers are fairly dry. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the fields around, they dry up. Yet we got this lush green pumpkin field that has not, not been watered. All we did was prep it. Uh, I'd say experiment. That's mm -hmm. all we did. That's how we got started. Mm -hmm. We had some seeds, we planted it. It's like, oh my goodness, they ran, they grew. Next year, I want to increase my, my varieties of things, you know, grow pumpkins and grow a different variety of cantaloupe and, and I'm going to try corn and some other things like that. And, you know, a climate like this, I think anybody could probably do dry farming if they had the space because one of the concepts here is that, that the, the plants are spaced far enough apart so that the, you know, this is just like, you know, this is my spot, These are this is my root spot. And so you have to give each plant that benefit to where they can grow out and they can grow down. So with the dry farmed uh, tomatoes, a lot of people, uh, dry farmed tomatoes have a, a cult following, especially in California, the dry farmed early girl tomato. And um, I've gotten uh, the pleasure of tasting a lot of them. And they are more concentrated in sugars and less watered down. Uh, we got to taste some of those today, like doing side by side, and the texture is like, you know, different as well. So sweetness and texture and color, um, the dry farm tomatoes are, are loved by a lot of people. When I bring these two people to taste, they, their eyes always light up and, and um, they're really impressed by the flavor and, and how um, they're not like really mealy or, you know, they, they are, I think, a, a superior product in a lot of ways. And, um, like I said, I think the results will speak for themselves over the long run. And um, in a lot of a lot of circumstances, I don't think that we'll have the option to do things in a in a different way. Um, if if water does get cut off in mid season, right when you need it the most, what, um, you know, what are you going to do? We're developing strategies and building this kind of drought mitigation toolbox um, decades in advance. Then I think that's going to um, build resiliency in our in our food system and um, and maybe you know we'll be conserving a lot of water as well.